you know, we don't frame it as a why question. It's what do you see mm. that makes you say that? Because you can't argue with what somebody sees. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory podcast. You joined us in our series entitled The Triple H, The Habits and Hacks from Hopkins. I'm Kim Skorupski, and I'm so pleased to bring to you today our guest, Dr. Margaret Chisholm. Hi, Meg. How are you doing? Hi, I'm great. Thanks, Kim, for having me. Really excited to be here. Well, I am excited to have you here because you do something so unique and so creative. I remember when I heard you talk about this maybe two years ago, my eyes lit up and I got really excited to learn more about it. And I'll we'll have this as a little bit of a teaser, but I would love for you to start out with telling everybody, you know, who you are here at Hopkins, what you do, a little bit about your background. Sure. So uh, I've been at Hopkins a long time. I came for my residency in 1988 and in psychiatry. And after training, I did a fellowship and then I worked at Homewood seeing um, students. Had a little interim where I was in private practice, but I came back to Hopkins full time in 2006 and was mainly running the first year of the psychiatry residency program, which is based at Bayview. So that was half my job. And the other half, I was working at the Center for Addiction and Pregnancy, providing psychiatric care to drug-dependent pregnant women. And while I was there, I did a lot of scientific research and, and had an R01 and kind of all the typical things that people do, and eventually was promoted to associate professor, primarily, I think, on the basis of that scientific work. But then, you know, my heart really was more into the education side of things. And so since, I guess, around 2009 or so, I've primarily been doing education research and teaching and educational administration. I'm the vice chair for education in our department. Now I'm a professor based primarily on my uh, role within the field of social media and um, medical education. That's who I am, but that's where I came from originally was I have a degree in visual arts, um, so I didn't think I wanted to be a doctor. I really hadn't taken much in the way of pre-med courses, had to go back and take all those courses and take the MCATs and all that. So, so visual arts is my first love, and I've only recently, since I was promoted to a full professor, decided to kind of reflect on what I really wanted to do with the rest of my career, having reached that milestone. And through a lot of serendipitous occurrences, ended up doing arts and humanities with a focus on visual arts in medical education work. So I have been running some programs and uh, doing education research related to the arts and humanities in medical education. There you go, folks. Now you see why we wanted to have Dr. Chisholm on the podcast today, because visual arts. And what I love about your story, Meg, is that you've been able to weave in something that was very important to you, that you are passionate about, that was something that feeds your soul, to use you know that kind of cliche. But when I first when I first met you and I came to Hopkins about eight and a half years ago, I remember organizing a, a promotion panel discussion. And you said something back then about you were way ahead of the curve about social media and talking about alt metrics and having to, you know, the idea of broadening our scope of criteria for promotion and exploring the use of social media and participation in looking at how we get our research out there. And, and I remember being really intrigued by your, um, your comments during that session, because they were, you know, they were kind of a, a far in advance of where we were back, you know, seven or eight years ago. And then when I heard you talk about visual arts, I said, what, who is this woman? And how <laughs> did she have this such a broad range? And now it comes clear to me. And what, what I, I know you have a couple of things to share with, but I wanted to share this with the audience as we think about mid-career, late-career, retirement, I'm a gerontologist by training, so I'm always thinking about how do we 
reinvent ourselves and the next chapter of our life and our identity and our vision and possibilities and who are we. And oftentimes I think in academic medicine, particularly, maybe in all ac- academia, we're so driven as professionals. And when you know, we, we've sought out to achieve all these milestones of this degree, that certification, this fellowship, this grant, this paper, this promotional status. And then you reach a point, or sometimes we reach a point where we think, all right, well, now that I've done that, what else, who else am I? Who, If I'm this, am I not that? And that this idea of what we can reinvent and recreate and re-envision ourselves anytime in our lives. And I love how you did just that. You paused, took a moment and said, visual arts. I started off as an artist and, and having that appreciation to bring it full circle. So I just think this is so exciting because it, you open up so many opportunities of reimagining, especially after at this time, a global pandemic and all this stress and anxiety and quarantining and so many, so many faculty just kind of questioning, who am I? Is this, am I doing what I love? So so I just really admire you and your work. So I'd love to have you just tell everybody more about how this evolved and, and the role of arts and humanities in your career and how you see it informing our profession. Sure, Kim. So, you know, I I do have this tendency to be a learner. (laughs) And so I always like to learn new things. Uh, So it, so that's where the social media stuff, I just didn't know anything about social media and I was curious about it. And similarly, even though I have a visual arts background, I really hadn't really thought about how it would ever connect to medicine Other than the obvious, I think when I was in medical school, I did an independent elective about, you know, looking at paintings and being able to recognize certain, you know, signs or symptoms of patient illnesses and the paintings or something like that, but really didn't have any thought about this until I went to the Harvard Macy Institute Health Professions Educators course. And that was in around 2014, 20, yeah, it was 2014. And at that course, there was an optional thing we could do, which was go to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts and have, you know, a curated experience there, uh, which I did. And I really liked what we did, which was looking at a painting and kind of just staying kind of curious about what was going on in the painting. And I really liked the experience and saw that the relevance to medicine of, you know, observing and thinking about providing evidence for some of the interpretations we were making and things like that. And so when I came back to Hopkins after that course, I took our our psychiatry interns down in groups of, well, sometimes just one, sometimes groups of up to three interns down to the National Gallery to look at some paintings down there that I pre-selected to look at some paintings using sort of that similar method that I had, you know, it's the old medicine, you know, see one, do one, teach one. I saw it done once, I can do it. So I then took these interns down there and actually made it into an academic exercise and they had to go out on their own and do it at a different museum and write an essay and make a poster and one of the students, actually, residents actually had their uh, essay published in the American Journal of Psychiatry as the cover article and things. So, I mean, it took on an academic aspect, but I was just doing it because I wanted to try it. And then I didn't really do much else for a couple of years. And I ran into somebody who was associated with the Harvard Macy Institute, who I also knew through the Gold Foundation, who had actually sponsored me to go on a scholarship to that program. And she said, hey, you know, we've got this new fellowship we're starting called the Art Museum-Based Health Professions Educator Fellowship. You should apply. Because she knew I was really keen on this. And I was like, oh, no, I'm way too busy. (laughs) I can't do that. I've got too much going on. She said, well, you, you know, you really should apply. And I just sort of ignored it. And then I was in Milwaukee for a meeting. And she was there at the same hotel for a totally different reason. And she was like, 
you know, you really should apply. And I said, well, this is too much, you know, here she is. <laughs> yeah. So I applied and I did it and it basically changed my life. I just fell in love with this field. And it was really, it's about visual arts and how to use the art museum as a teaching space for health professions learners. So there were 12 of us, um, some were nurses, some were, there was a dentist from the UK, there was somebody from Australia and we had a project and my project was coming back to Hopkins and designing something for the medical students. And there was also this one method that they use, visual thinking strategies. They taught several methods, but that one method, it really clicked with me. And so I got extra training in that through the visual thinking strategies organization and actually eventually became certified as a facilitator in this. And if that's not crazy enough, when I went up for my training in visual thinking strategies, uh, happened to be in Boston uh, as well, the person said, hey, you live in Baltimore? The guy that developed visual thinking strategies, one of the co-developers, he just moved to Baltimore. Oh, my gosh, Meg. Oh, really? <laughs> meant to be talking. Oh, it gets better. Stuff. It gets better. Sure. Kim, Kim, so I was like figuring out, oh, there must be, Baltimore's a small town, relatively. I must figure, I must know somebody that will know this person, whatever. You know, I waited months, months. Finally, somebody did know him that I knew and said, oh, you know, I'll invite you to dinner and whatever. And so she emails this person, Philip Yenowin, who was the former director of museum education at MoMA, and says, you know, I'd like you to um, come to dinner with, uh, you know, uh, Meg Chisholm. And he said, oh, around our house, she's known as Dr. Chisholm. And I was like, what? And it turns out all this time, my financial analyst for this big uh, clinical trial I'm doing, um, it's another story, um, is, was this person's partner and now they're married. Oh, I was like, no. Yes. No. I was like, you know, Leo, did you ever think that you were putting in things for, you know, reimbursement for me that were related? Yeah, it did sound a lot like what Philip does. Oh my gosh. It really feels meant to be. I feel oh, like I've gosh, come full circle. <laughs> yeah. And, and so this has been my, uh, kind of my love for the last uh, several years. Thank you for sharing this story. I just think it's just another confirmation that, boy, there's a plan. And and if we're going to close our eyes, you know, we're going to, everywhere we turn, it's going to be put back in our face. No, this is what you're supposed to be doing. This is what you're supposed to be doing. So it's a wonderful story and a great reminder to be aware and to be mindful of these other gifts and talents and, you know, I'm putting my fingers up for air quotes, coincidences that maybe, you know, are supposed to be signals telling us to start doing this or stop doing that or pause a moment. So I think it's a, a wonderful um, story that maybe some of us can think, hmm, are there any aha moments that we are in such a rush that we are, are maybe missing some opportunities along the way. So I think it's a great story. I would love before you, I know you wanted to talk about um, the role of arts and humanities, but you said two things that I would love to know just a little bit more about. And, and the one was the curated comma curious experience. So you said the, a curated experience, but then you said, you know, being curious. And so I'm calling it a curated, curious experience. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit, just a little bit about, make that a little richer for us? What does that look like or feel like a curated? Oh, experience? I would love to. This is my, this is all I care about. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> so this is uh, the visual thinking strategies method. Right. Um, uh, which is um, a very structured way of facilitating an open discussion around a, a work of art. And it's really not about the art itself. It's the way the art opens us up to reflection and to kind of sharing. This is the method that was developed by Philip Yanowin and Abigail Husson. So basically when Philip Yanowin was the director of museum education at MoMA, his boss, the director of the museum said, hey, how do you know that anything you teach is really working? <laughs> and he was like, well, I guess we don't really know. And so they studied 
this and they found that, yeah, people don't remember a thing that they're <laughs> told when they come into the museum. They enjoy the experience. Great satisfaction scores, but they didn't really retain anything. And so he paired up with Abigail Houston, who's this, uh, what well, she just passed away recently, but she uh, was a, a aesthetic development psychologist. They teamed up and they looked at the stages of aesthetic development and found that 80% of people that look at art are curious about the story that the art is telling. And so they developed a method around that curiosity. And so the, the method involves a moment of silent looking and then uh, an opening question by the facilitator, which is what's going on in this picture or if it's a sculpture in this sculpture. And one person volunteers to respond to that and might say whatever they think is going on. And the facilitator in a very neutral and conditional way validates what they've said. They paraphrase it uh, verbally. They might link it to things that other people say later, either in contrast or similarly they visual paraphrase, they point to what the person's talking about. And then if somebody says, you know, whatever, this person seems angry, they might say, well, what do you see that makes you say that this person seems angry? Asking for evidence for these observations. And then they paraphrase that the evidence that's provided. And then they open it up to the next person with another question, which is what more can we find? And this can go on usually a minimum of 15 minutes, but it can go on for 45 minutes with one image. And, you know, people share their different perspectives. They reflect, they look, they listen, they articulate their ideas, they revise their ideas. They learn to kind of ground their observations and evidence. They learn to tolerate ambiguity because there's no signal given by the facilitator that this is a right answer, this is a wrong answer. Like I said, everything is couched in conditional language. You're saying that this, you know, this looks to you like a female, you wondering about the setting, thinking this could be, uh, you know, in England or whatever it is. And that's how the discussion goes. And then at the end, usually there's some acknowledgement of what the title of the painting is and or if it's painting and, and the artist just to satisfy some basic curiosity. And if people wanted to, they could go look up what other people have said about this image. But that's it. That's a it's a very structured uh, approach to um, a discussion that requires the participants to listen to others, to articulate their own ideas, to revise their ideas, to ground their ideas in evidence, to tolerate ambiguity, to be comfortable with the unfamiliar, to appreciate different perspectives, to become aware of their own biases. Well, maybe there isn't any reason that I can see that that person is angry, but because they're, you know, this race or this gender, I just said that they were angry. So there's a lot of clinically relevant skills Mm. that are involved, and that becomes very clear to participants. So after one of these sessions, in a formal way, we debrief with those questions, you know, what does this require of you? And then what role the facilitator plays, because that can give us some insight for us in terms of our own teaching, you know, what what makes it possible for people to feel comfortable who have, might have no art background whatsoever mm-hmm. to be able to bring forth their ideas. So it takes some risk, some courage, especially for many health professions learners who mm-hmm. might not feel as comfortable uh, around you know field that they're not immersed in. Meg, this is just so profound. I feel like we could talk for a couple hours on this. I so appreciate the, the way this methodology and it reminds me of so many just different, uh, we could walk down so many paths on that, on this really rich process. And I'm immediately reflecting on my training as a, a lay pastoral counselor. And we using, using the Rams approach, reflect, ask, mirror, silence. So that the reflecting when you're with a patient, you're doing uh, lay pastoral tra- chaplain training you just reflect on what they said, you ask questions, you mirror them, and then you'd be comfortable with the silence. And that reminded me of that. It also 
when you were describing this process reminded me of a recent a coaching certification course I took, which gets you into the coaching mindset of experiencing being in a moment with someone and uh, being also patient and that comfortable with the ambiguity, not quite sure, letting them lead the conversation. You you said experiences in the context of tolerating ambiguity and maybe being aware of someone saying, well, I see anger. And, and you'd say, well, you know, you know, why do you see anger or where do you see anger? And when you said the why part, it, it kind of like a little red flag because I, you know, through coaching and the pastoral training, a why tends to be almost um, putting someone on a defensive as if they have to argue in defense of, well, this is why I see it. But the way in this process, I love how that opens up the experiences to, I see it because of this, where someone, you can't argue with someone's experiences. So let me kind of just make sure I'm being um, clear here is, when I've done mediation, like conflict mediation, oftentimes there's no utility if two people are clashing to say, person A, what happened? And then person B will say, that's not at all what happened. Person B says, it happened like this. And then person A says, no, that's not how it happened. So rather than saying, what happened that made you two clash? What, you know, what happened in that meeting? What, what happened in the lab? Rather, Meg, how did you experience what happened in that meeting. And therefore, Kim can say, well, Meg, I I refute your experience. That's not at all what you experienced because that's a personal, you experienced that. And then Kim, what did you experience? And I love this process of in the art, how are you experiencing anger or depression? And then that opens me up to go, you know, oh, well, Yes, that's interesting. I never thought that that might evoke. So that's what I love is the opening up to the conversation and the greater appreciation of their different lenses by which we can view and see things. So that's what I just think this is such a mind blowing strategy or framework to having those aha moments and then taking that process back into fill in the blank, your clinical practice, your research lab your team building, your family, your marriage, that I love that tolerating ambiguity. I just think it's so wonderful. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought up because, you know, we don't frame it as a why question. It's what do you see Mm. that makes you say that? Because you can't argue with what somebody sees, right? And it doesn't put people on the defensive, really, because it is yeah, I agree. I don't like to ask why questions with my pa- with my learners. I ask them not to ask patients, you know, why do you feel sad? Like they have to justify it, um, or, you know, or they might not know why they feel sad. If they have a disease, there might be no reason, and it's implying that there should be a reason. So I love uh, that it's a very structured approach, and the language and the the wording has been very carefully selected mm-hmm. to. Um, lift up everyone's uh, powers of observation to make them feel more confident that they're, that they're to validate yes. that, th- them as a viewers and thinkers. Yeah. So. so you, you, before I, um, I let you move on, I really want to explore one more thing with you. You said that Abigail, Abigail Husson and Philip Yenowen from mm-hmm. Mohawk. So you talked about that 80% of the um, museum goers were curious about the artist's intentions. And then you said that, that there was not a lot of retention of anything. They had an enjoyable experience. And I'm right away going into the patient experience, the learner experience, the faculty experience. So does this visual thinking strategy, does is there demonstrable improvement then in the the retention and learning how does that work play out yeah so this is um so 80 percent of people are curious about the story the art is telling not necessarily the artist's intention because you know sometimes the artist doesn't even know what they're intending it's more visceral the story the art is telling so that's really beginning viewers and then as you as you 
advance in your aesthetic development. Some would say it's not an advance. You know, you might be curious about the artists, the history of the artist, the genre, the medium, all these other kinds of art, um, you know, history kinds of lessons. Um, but eventually people who reach the sort of highest stage of viewing, they go back to just kind of looking at the art and kind of putting all that knowledge aside and just being uh, in the experience itself of viewing. So I think the beginner's eye or the beginner's mind is a really valid place to start. Um, and it's a place that it's perfectly fine to end up too, as we see with advanced viewers. So, um, so what they found was when they started using this method in the museum with their school groups or other groups that came through, uh, people were, you know, school teachers were calling them back and saying, you know, not only did, was it a great experience, but now this kid that never spoke up in class before is speaking up, or now people in a social studies class are providing evidence for their thoughts rather than just wow. spewing off a thought. So they saw that the skills, not only it was building skills mm. that would transfer to other settings. And that's what, and so they studied this. They had a randomized uh, trial in public schools. They have a whole school, um, public school and private school kinds of a curriculum, a curricula that they offer. But then about 10, 15 years ago, it really started being used with medical learners for the very same reasons, because it wasn't like we wanted to teach medical students about art for art's sake, not that there's anything wrong with it, but, you know, the important, and it's fun and all those good things and relaxing and, but, you, you know, it's not just, you know, a harmless additive. It actually develops clinically relevant skills, including not only sort of quote unquote hard skills, um, like close observation, but, it, but uh, you know, uh, personal insights, appreciation for multiple perspective, being able to sort of reflect on and critique the culture of medicine. This, with carefully selected images, we can say, well, okay, so this is a very ambiguous, and people have said, you know, some people are more comfortable with the ambiguity, some people are less. You know, what is this, how does medicine situate ambiguity? Um, and you know, how is that for you versus you? And so you can actually use the arts and humanities to, uh, critique social concepts or constructs or for social advocacy. I love how when you said the focus is on the story, the art is telling. And I wrote that down, the story, the art is telling. And right away, I thought, Gosh, then I can see how that would tell me as the, the person who, got, who has gone through this experience, what is the story the learner is telling me? What is the story the patient is telling me? What is the story the faculty member is telling me? And just the idea of thinking, what more can we find here? As, a, as in coaching, what else? What else? What more? Listening between the lines. When this patient is in front of me presenting to me as a work of art, what do I see when I look at it? And where's the evidence that tells me that? What do I feel in the presence of this family system? And what evidence tells me this? So I, I can definitely see that the parallels between that silent looking, what's going on here, a visual and an auditory kind of reflection of, of what I'm seeing. And I can, I can almost see this playing out in a patient examining room, in a classroom or at the bedside teaching, or when I work with faculty members, I just think that's such a great way of approaching anything we're doing or a lot of things we're doing. Exactly. Yeah. I think, and I, the students or various learners that we've engaged in these programs, they get that. And they also, the thing that strikes them most is how long we look at something. <laughs> you know, most people spend 11 seconds looking at a piece of art in a museum. <laughs> I mean, and they will say, you know, we looked at this for half an hour, 40 minutes. And with looking, we saw things in the last five minutes that we didn't see at the beginning mm. and how important the time spent is. And that's so relevant, of course, to patient care. 
Right. And before I know you want to talk about the double A and C report on the, the roles of arts and humanities, but I'm also I can't help but put in one last um, thing I'd love you to comment on is the opposite end of that relationship. So I can envision scenarios whereby through some purposeful organization of our environment, of our waiting rooms, our classrooms, our offices, our buildings, our hallways, having set up experiences that will get or inspire or encourage our patients, our learners, our faculty members, our leaders to, to be around art, however broadly you define it, to kind of invoke that awareness and that kind of aha moment and weaving that into, you know, the patient exam rooms. I, I can envision scenarios whereby you could have conversation starters and, and allowing some little light bulbs and space to open up in these conversations and meetings that maybe would help a patient retain or remember something. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm thinking of the Remington, Johns Hopkins uh, Health uh, Clinic in Remington, you know, where they partnered with Maryland Institute College of Art, MICA, to design art for each of the exam rooms. I mean, that space is really interesting. And also, an aside, I'm, this is a total aside, but we developed an app, a web-based app, uh, with uh, images of art and as well as poetry to be used at the bedside with patients, you know, so because you could imagine patients going to a web, being asked, you know, there's a bunch of images here on this website. Why don't you go through those and find an image that really speaks to you uh, that uh, that would help you communicate with us about your experience, right? You know, that would really capture for us um, some insights about your experience. I think there are ways to use art as a prompt for communication between patients and doctors, as well as between the, the uh, healthcare team. That's right. Wow, so much opportunity. So the, the, this report, tell us a little bit about how this tied in, you know, nationally to this, the accredited, you know, Association of American Medical Colleges report. Yeah, so the Association of American Medical Colleges, the AAMC in 2017, started an initiative called The Fundamental Role of the Arts and Humanities in Medical Education. So they had a work group and they, from the work group, they decided that they were going to commission a scoping review. And so they partnered with a couple of other um, organizations to come up with some funds for a scoping review. There was a call for proposals for that, those teams. Hopkins put forth a team. We weren't selected, but a team with many people I know on it were selected, led by Lorelai Lingard in uh, Toronto. I don't know if she's in Toronto, in Canada. She's in Western Ontario. And she and her team uh, did the scoping review. It was a really tight turnaround. It was uh, what they wanted the manuscript delivered in a year. And it's a very big topic, the arts and humanities and medical education. And they full text reviewed, I want to say something like 20,000, some enormous number of articles. And they called it down to 700 articles that were over, um, almost 800 actually, articles that were in this final review. And so from that project, the AAMC has a report that they issued a monograph. It's the only the third time the AAMC has issued a monograph with some research gaps and kind of a summary of the uh, review. And also there were these three papers that came out of that project. One was the scoping review itself, which is online now in academic medicine, an academic medicine last page, sort of an infographic on a model explaining sort of the how, uh, you know, the functions that the arts and humanities serve, and then a longer paper about that model that came out in the Perspectives uh, on Medical Education Journal. And those all came out within, I think the frame report came out from the AAMC, their monograph in December of 2020. And then those other three papers came out subsequently to that. So right now. <laughs> right, right. Wow. Hot off the press. Yeah, so that's that's a really exciting, and they've also had a grants program. They uh, had a call for proposals. I think they got over two hundred proposals. They were like up to twenty five thousand dollar grants to address the gaps in the literature. And 
uh, one team from Hopkins led by Kamna Balhara got one of the eight grants. <laughs> so that was really great. And I think we're putting together quite a team here at Hopkins uh, so that we have, um, so I did the art museum based fellowship mm-hmm. in the inaugural cohort. And then the next cohort, Kamna Balhara, who's an emergency medicine doctor and Sarah Clever, who is an internist here at Hopkins, they both participated in the fellowship last year. And then this coming year, Rachel Salas, who's a neurologist on our faculty, is one of the fellows. So we're putting together, I think, a core group of people with skills to lead art museum-based teaching for our learners. It's interesting. I didn't know Rachel Salas was involved in that because she um, and Charlene Gamaldo, both in neurology, are trained in the Clifton Strengths Finders. And as you were talking about, about this this process and this method, it, it really kind of invoked this a nice um, merging of looking at people's strengths because then you'd be able to um, really kind of encourage that this this thinking with people who have certain strengths and then others, you could see how they, you would be able to work with that, um, their strengths, maybe if they're not at all a visual learner, but I thought there's lots of opportunity to, to explore people's strengths through that Clifton Strengths Finder and then find ways to, it's just to, just to to use the word that I hate to synergize with, with this, the whole um, visual thinking strategy. So it's interesting with Rachel and yeah, Sarah Clever, Kamna Balhara, Balhara. I don't know her and ER. I'll have to find, uh, find her. She trained here as a medical student and then went to San Antonio to do her residency in emergency medicine. So, and she directs the, with Rachel, and Lauren Small, the Health Humanities track for our graduates. Oh, oh really interesting story. But wow, wow. Yeah, I did the uh, Clifton Strengths. That's how I knew I was a learner. Oh. But I, I'm also futuristic. <laughs> Me too. Me too. I, I, yeah, I, I love that I learned. Yeah, I'm an input. I'm just looking at now input, strategic, futuristic, achiever, intellect. So I'm very strategic. Yeah, four out of five four of five. mine are strategy. Yeah. Me too. Me too. See, that's why we we kind of <laughs> very similar mindsets. Well, what other things I know you um, did you want to share that you may be doing with with the audience? Well, I'll just kind of tell you a few things that we've been doing. So we got a little grant from the Idea Lab from the Provost's office. So before the pandemic, so um, we got that in the fall of 2019. I think in December of 2019, we heard about it. So we ran a program for pre-med or pre-health profession students actually at the Baltimore Museum of Art um, with funding from that program. And luckily we hit the ground running (laughs) in late January. So we were able to get four of our six planned sessions in before the pandemic shut down uh, teaching both for the students and at the museum. So we've done that. And then we have, uh, we piloted in the 2019 to 20 academic year, we piloted six two-hour sessions for third and fourth year medical students at the Baltimore Museum of Art that were, um, they were meant to be part of a 2021 course at the museum, (laughs) but uh, they, uh, and that ended up being delayed to 2022, but uh, we piloted that and did focus groups and, and surveys and uh, are analyzing that data with the medical students. So we did six of those planned eight sessions before the pandemic shut us down. We have been doing a lot during the pandemic around well-being and using looking at art as a way to support uh, some kind of centeredness and c- contemplative sort of practice uh, of uh, looking at art and reflecting, um, and, and people have valued that. We also pivoted our planned art museum course to a one-week online course that we've offered five times to medical students. And Philip Yenowin has led the co-led that with me. That was two hours of synchronous sessions and then asynchronous assignments, like going out into nature, doing some things that some of the students really uh, valued as experiences that they weren't typically um, Mm -hmm. getting as part of the educational programming. Mm -hmm. So we've done that five times. And we actually got, um, I'm co-investigator on a discovery award with a computer scientist as the lead at Homewood 
to um, compare three different methods of analysis of narrative text. So the students write narrative reflections, and it's very time consuming to you know, to do a human qualitative analysis of narrative text. Mm -hmm. And so we're looking at ways to use machine learning to expedite the process in a way that's actually as valid. So we're comparing two artificial intelligence methods. One is an existing method, which we don't think is very good. And then the other is a unique uh, method that we've computer scientist has developed, and then we're doing our human qualitative analysis of those and going to compare those. Because, you know, the big, in order for us to put more arts and humanities in medical learner curricula, we really need to show its value. And the only way we can show its value uh, is, I think, meaningfully is through qualitative methods. And that's very labor intensive, time consuming. So we're looking at ways to expedite that so that we can increase the evidence base uh, around this in medicine. And then we, uh, Kamana Balhara um, and I got a grant from the Institute for Excellence in Education to uh, run a CME course. So we ran an online CME course yeah. um, using arts-based methods. And one of our mentees at Homewood got a grant to develop a digital library to represent diverse, especially people of color, but also diverse genders in uh, health professions in medicine. And then we also got a Shark Tank Institute for Excellence in Education award to build a digital library to um, a digital image library to support anti-racism programs and curricula. So we've got a lot going on, <laughs> a little too much <laughs> if you ask any of us. Uh, but it's what we really want to do and what we love doing. So um, we're excited about yeah. all the opportunities. Uh, I mean, I think so much you pointed to is so relevant now. A lot of the, uh, you said earlier, the unconscious bias. It, it just, to me, seems so obvious that this format and art and humanities is such an obvious way to measure impact, you know, the value of what we do in immediate. Uh, I bet you a, a standardized tool looking at just changes uh, in attitude and being aware of biases. Yeah. Right. And it's a way to do it in a, a non-threatening way, right? It's a, these are challenging topics. Race is a challenging topic right. and talking with, you know, this art provides this third thing, this object that can be, you know, something we talk about right. um, that makes us a little more comfortable with some challenging topics. Exactly. Age and ability, uh, ethnicity, race, culture, height, weight. I mean, there's so, so many things. Uh, you can yep. see how it <laughs> opens up all different uh, ways of, is, and isn't it all about just seeing, you know, art literally and metaphorically and figuratively, it's what do we see and how do we see and how do you see and, and, so I think it's just really opening our eyes and shifting the lens and the frames. So I think it's just so incredibly innovative and I'm so thrilled that we you know we're doing this and I'm so glad that um, you came on the podcast today and I'm, I've learned a lot and I'm sure everybody else on the podcast has learned a great deal about visual thinking strategies and this curated curious experience and just lots and lots of great stuff. So Folks, you've been um, enjoying Dr. Margaret Meg Chisholm, a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences and of medicine. She's a member of our elite Miller Colson Academy of Clinical Excellence here at Johns Hopkins. Meg, thanks so much for being on the Faculty Factory podcast with us. Thank you, Kim. I'm so excited. Thanks. All right, great. Till the next time, folks. Bye now. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.